Hello and welcome back to the Historical Humans Podcast. We are now on episode 10, which we're going to take a deep dive into the Moche people of South America after uh, Cullum and I had watched uh, William Shatner's The Unexplained and they started off history in South America talking about the Inca. So I think it's probably a good point to start diving into some pre-Incan South American cultures. My name is Justin Woods, and I'm joined today by Colm Coleman and Gwendolyn Allen. Do you want to lead us into things now? All right, sure. So for our first uh, step into South America, we're going to be taking a look at the Moche people. Uh, they are a pyramid-building society that, pre- that predate the Inca by several hundred to over a thousand years. Uh, they are the Mochi people, also known as the Mochica. They inhabited the northern coast and valleys of Peru, uh, most uh, prominently the Chicama and Trujillo valleys. Uh, We will be mispronouncing some names. I do apologize for that. Uh, They inhabited this territory from about one to 800 uh, common era. So about the time of Jesus uh, onward. Uh, They expanded their territory southward to uh, Warme Valley and northward to Pura Valley and even uh, took hold of the Chinka Islands. These people spoke two separate but related languages, but were still part of the single uh, cultural group in a sort of loose confederacy of essentially common peoples. Uh, north of a place called Lambayek Valley, uh, the people spoke Mochik, and to the south they spoke Quingan. And uh, We've got a lovely little, what should I call it, timeline to help you uh, follow along uh, with us a little bit as this cultural split is very relevant uh, between the North and South Mochi for most of their history. So um, the uh, Mochi and slash Mochica peoples, uh, they really come into their own and have their main force driving force as a civilization uh from about 100 to 750 common era they do exist for about a century beforehand and carry on uh and what can be described as a mochi people for about another 50 years afterward before sort of petering out like a bell curve of uh of sort of cultural prominence so go lay down the uh um, the northern and southern peoples are separated uh, not only uh, along the line of the Lambayek Valley, but also by the geographical barrier of the uh, Pahan Desert of Peru. The, uh, uh, they established two separate capitals, the northern Mochi capital of Sipan and the southern Mochi capital of Huacas de Mochi. Uh, there are several uh, key phases of their history uh, for about the first 500 years of their existence up to 550 CE. Um, they are a, uh, uh, sorry, uh, they are a uh, fairly unified and consistent people. Uh, about 300 to 400 uh, CE, they split into the Northern and Southern cultures and those cultures become distinctive. Um, and one of the key notes with how these things are measured is you might hear us referring to mochi by terms such as early, middle, late, or by phase one, two, three. Uh, southern mochi are designated along terms of phases, and northern mochi are designated along terms of uh, early, late, and uh, as such, uh, and so on. Um, around uh, between... Uh, Five uh, after about 550, uh, as we get close to 800 and beyond, uh, the southern Mochi people uh, along their split do develop into the pre Chima or Chasma people, and that culture contains distinctions of Mochi ness without being a Mochi people so much. Uh, on down to about 1200, as late as 1200 CE, uh, when uh when they become the Chimu people in the south, the uh, the uh, northern Mochi, uh, following along the same timeline, 
by about 1200 uh, CE have become the Sakan people. Uh, more or less uh, fading away into uh, into this uh, other distinct culture. Um, these uh, societies were very heavily stratified, lots of rituals to be involved that we're going to uh, see the aftermath of, and they loved to build monuments. These were a pyramid building people and Oh God, did they ever build them? I, I thought the aliens built the pyramids. Only in that Egypt, Justin. Right. Only in Egypt. <laughs> that is a long-standing pseudo myth within the field that is ridiculous. People built pyramids. It is one of the easiest shapes to yep. build. <laughs> it's not even myth within the field. It's just a myth that so many. I not to say this so derogatorily, but so many like high people think like you know. It's not even that. It's the like conspiracy theorists that think aliens built them, and it's it called denying non-white people the ability to act human. Yes, <laughs> that's what yeah. it is. It's just racism, guys. It it really you know. is, and it fucking sucks. Uh, yeah. Not only that, but like so many people don't know that pyramids exist outside of Egypt. <laughs> It's um, it's seen universal. You have them in Asia. You have them in South America. You have them in North America. I mean, and, our, and you know the most wonderful. You have part them in all other places in Africa. Like yeah. it is a giant ass oh, continent. Yeah. There are Nubian other places pyramids. in there though that built pyramids. Yeah, and guess what? They all look different. They all have different architectural styles, as you will see with the Wakas of the Mochi people, uh, as we sort of describe and describe them to you later on. Um, Hopefully, Gwen, we can get some sort of uh, art rendition of what they look like, maybe for a thumbnail or something else, if that is possible. I will definitely do my best to do that. Yep. Yes. Because yeah. Yeah. So, my doodle love is just going to be a bunch of squares that aren't even <laughs> rightly shaped. Like, that's going to be my doodle. Do not let me draw. And don't worry. Don't worry. I will, no. I, I will whip something up. Yeah. So we have monumental architecture. I mean, you could see that there's but you can see that there's artistic things happening like you, you don't build monumental architecture on a failing society like your no. society has to be thriving you have to have the manpower you have to have the labor because if your people are struggling for food you're gonna have those people doing some sort of food production not you know building a monument Exactly. You have to have the riches. However you define riches within your society, you have to have them to be able to have that layer and the resources to actually build the thing. Yep. Uh, and, it's uh, not like they can just order it on Amazon or something, you know. They, <laughs> yeah. they have and to be able to find Amazon. this shit and know how to work it. We are not it Amazons are on the wrong side of the Andes <laughs> for the Justin. And uh speaking of agriculture, the uh uh, we met, I mentioned earlier that the Mochi are a stratified society, and there was, in fact, an entire cast of people dedicated to agriculture. They were a, uh, yeah. an elite class, actually, called the Karaka, um, and they organized uh, massive um, uh, agricultural endeavors, just levels of aqueducts, rectangular plots, canals, massive reservoir. Um, the land outside the uh, capital, uh, the, the capital of Mochi, uh, their, one of their biggest cities, could support about 25,000 people. So this is, a, uh, this is an industrial project uh, on par with what the Romans are doing at about the same time. If not, in fact, better than the Romans, as the Romans are kind of going into decline during most of the time that the Mochi are thriving. <laughs> what? You, you mean that a society outside of Europe can thrive? Uh, that joke what? is dead, and be Justin. original, unlike the Romans. What? But yeah. you could see that people had control over water landscape. Like they were really starting to build their own and to start building up, because you you don't have a successful society if you can't support the people there with food production. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of cool because throughout, no matter where you are in the world, that food production becomes such a valuable thing as the elite class shows. Because those people who are producing the food basically mean that other people are able to start doing more, I don't want to say useless jobs, but more jobs that you don't need to focus on to survive. So, like, you I start mean, to... 
that was a whole thing of you know cultures i don't say evolving but changing is when you have agriculture and you have a system of agriculture where no one needs to be hunting and gathering anymore you can focus on other things and you can focus on more unique things um so if i really enjoy pottery i can work on pottery constantly i don't have to worry about getting food because bob down the street he's farming the food he can give me you know the maize and i'll give him some pottery <laughs> so that we can share those things i don't know why i use bob as a name yes, when we're bob, talking bob, about bob, bob, <laughs> bob the ancient uh andean mochi <laughs> listen bob is always andean, the first name that comes andean. into mind when i think about someone else i'm sorry like, I don't know, we, we'll, we'll call Bob yeah. Jorge. It'll be yeah. Jorge yeah. instead. It's like those historic yeah. names that sound really modern but aren't. Like, no. one of my favorites no. is Tiffany. Yeah. Now, oh, my yeah. question, my next question for, for, for Gwen here is why a pre Columbian society has Spanish names? <laughs> okay, fine. Whatever. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't know. choose <laughs> good names. My apologies. <laughs> I don't know any. Even earlier. Yeah. I, that, but you know just, what? Just, just to get to the point, I'm sorry. Regardless, Gwen. my non survival tasks. <laughs> you are able to undergo non survival tasks because yes. those survival tasks are so well organized that people can dedicate their time, energy, and even lives to not dying. <laughs> well, and that's when yes. we start seeing a lot more naturalistic murals. We see ceramics, we see metalworks. I mean, we could go on for for a very long time about ceramics. <laughs> yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> oh no, don't threaten me with a good time. Like, oh god. I'm a classical It's a good time for you guys. You guys are the archaeologists. Things I'm over here like, okay, yeah. Things it's an I interesting spout. Product. Great. <laughs> it's iconography, damn it. <laughs> Yeah. All right, but regardless, you know that is something to look at, and I also love that you see that um, the agriculturists are the elite society because I think definitely in in our society now and in many other places in the world, um, you don't see that. It's it's very much that they're either like a solid middle class or even a lower class, which is very interesting um, as like farmers go. Yeah, and, uh, and so the, the farther you get back, the more control over food you have, the more power you have. And the thing to note, too, is that the Karaka were not necessarily the field hands, uh, the people in the fields every day. The Karaka were the people <laughs> who essentially ran the uh, ran the aqueducts and made sure that the fields were functional. I thought uh, you were about to say they were the land they barons. I thought like, they were like supposed to be the feudal lords. They, they control it. This is a stratified society. So these are the people who control essentially the water in the fields and organize the, the land to produce. Ah, oh, so they are feudal lords. God damn it. Okay, they, well, never mind. They, they are basically feudal anymore. lords. Whatever. Uh, but, disappointing. But, but, you know, the, the, people, the people controlling the agriculture output are a lot more important in the Mochi society than they are today. Well, and speaking of the aqueducts, and to pull pull this runaway train back into the station a little bit, there, by five fifty, we're still C going on the tracks. You know, <laughs> we're just we we got one wheel off. That's it. I feel like we're on a bunch of switchbacks in the mountains, back forth, back forth. All right, but by five fifty, they had the can the Moche Canal system, and they had fields that was actually covered entirely in sand from the coast to help bring extra nutrients and extra fertilizer in. Mm -hmm. So they had a sophisticated understanding of how to farm. Yeah. Yeah. Which they needed to, to be able to build the kind of society that they have. And the, um, ooh, what is the word? Urban cities. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Urban they centers. Had. They had a lot of urban centers. Urban yeah. centers uh, yep. And a few One administrative my... centers too. Yep. A um, couple are Panamarca, Juan Cacao, Veru Valley, Pampa de los Incas, which is ironic that it's got an Inca name, but we're I digress. That is, that, that is because it's... that is because the uh, Spanish, when they arrived, uh, found the Chimu living in what was once Mochi territory, and just said, "Hey, you guys are kind of by where the Inca are. We're just going to call you people Inca." <laughs> And then I mean, Santa like, Valley. It's like mo most of these places, a lot of these places are not abandoned uh, after the mochi. Um, leave them. A lot of them continue to be inhabited, inhabited up to the point that the Spanish arrive and just sort of 
uh, take a wrecking ball to society. <laughs> so you mean even when a society Those collapses, finish. its urban centers are reused by descendant communities and descendant mm -hmm. groups? Yeah, one, yeah. One of the uh, one of the exceptions to this actually, it's actually an exception rather than the rule for a lot of the post things. Is there's a place called Pampa Grande, uh, which uh, covered 600 hectares, had a 55 meter high uh, Waka Fortezella um, that was very uniquely built. This one uh, got wiped out by people called the Wari, uh, who uh, were another warlike people that sort of rose up. Uh, in the vicinity around the Mochi territory, and they just they set fire to this town, and it just got wiped off the map, <laughs> which was pretty uncommon for the uh, for the Mochi to happen. They were a warrior people, but their cities typically didn't fall; they just changed I hands. Was I was about to say, I, I would have thought that you know, being a warrior society most of their places would have burned down. They would have been exterminated because that's generally what you see. So. Well, a lot, a lot of them would have suffered, you know, defeats in war and taken damage. However, most of the time it's uh, the, well, the Mochi don't necessarily collapse the way like something like the Romans collapse where it's a foreign invader wiping you out. They just sort of transition into a different cultural group entirely. So it's, it's a descendant community. Uh, that is distinct and different inhabiting the territory as opposed to an outside force like, say, the Spanish coming in and occupying it. Uh, Pampa Grande is one of the times where a foreign force enters and occupies Mochi territory. And it's one of the few times uh, we really see that happen, uh, at least insofar as I found. There's probably more examples, but. So what you're saying is the Mochi people are better than the Romans. I think we should just have the stance that now. Is not, that is not what I'm saying. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we are here for Rome for lasted Mochi longer and built bigger. Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. I think they've done a lot of things better than the Romans so far as we talked about. I don't know. In the comments, tell us, like, after this podcast, you know, tell An us. Empire which, not which even the think? seventh the size. <laughs> Look, it's, it's not about size. It's about how you use your empire. And about and, a, oh and about God. half the lifespan. Look, it's not about the length of the empire. It's not. Really, it's not about how long you go? Are you sure about that? <laughs> Are you sure about know. that? Because you are making some innuendos, and I'm not going to let this die. I'm not. I'm you are making talking. some, and I think it's just more telling of you as a guy. <laughs> I'm not making any innuendos. I'm just talking about the length of the empire. Yeah, how long can the empire sure, go? Sure, 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 sure. It's not You're about... the one that had that shitty eating grin. Yeah. <laughs> now who's oh, taking what us does off size the tracks? Matter mean? <laughs> oh, right. it was. It was. Anyways, it's still better than Rome. I I still think it's better. Than, uh, that that's just that's the opinion I'm forming right now. Um, but their territory yeah. was expansive. They their borders. Um, went from the border uh, with Ecuador to the Huarme River Valley, and it, the way they were able to tell that was based on the a bunch of similarities between the ceramics and metal artworks found throughout the area. Although the big thing to note here is they weren't a single unified political entity; it was individual different groups and bands. Yeah, they and, were they were confederacies. Yes, <laughs> and you could see different styles, iconography, architecture that actually varied and differed depending on the area. So there was a lot of regional variations within that as well, which is really really cool. Yeah, yeah. the The biggest one is, uh, you know, we you know we mentioned a lot of metalwork and ceramics. There's actually a divide along the northern and southern Mochi with the language, with that desert, with Lombayek Valley, of just the Northerners do a lot of metal work and they get very good at it. And the uh, Southerners master, uh, master a lot of pottery and ceramic art. And those become the primary distinct mediums for the two different, uh, at, at first, essentially subgroups of the mochi. <laughs> it becomes a very big distinction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good trade too. No, it's it's interesting yeah. to see like it's effectively 
nearly identical groups just with small regional differences and then you have that big language and ceramic divide yeah yeah it's a very much a gradient uh, these people occupied about 215 miles of coastline and just as you work your way through the uh endless maze that is peru uh you affect you effectively uh see no two no two settlements are the same but they're all distinctly mochi <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's that can happen with language, especially when there's a geographical barrier. Um, I guess this, the the same thing would be like Italy, um, northern and southern Italy. Um, they speak different kinds of Italian and most of them can't understand each other. But since they're still in Italy, it's both Italian. Because um, one of the things uh, us linguistics likes to say is the only uh, difference in uh most languages is political power and that's how you just uh divide them unless it's you know language family and whatnot um and that's probably what happened here is that they had that geographical barrier and those dialects got more and more distinct as time went on to the where they could become two different languages because well, we have the better part of a millennia in which these people are prominent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you also bring up a very interesting point, too, is because of how fragmented the society was, pretty much every river valley or string of towns had its own government. Yeah. So even yeah. then, it's regionally subdivided. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want, you want to go up and down that whole 250 miles of coast, you're going to pass through... Uh, you're going to pass through more countries than a Eurorail train. <laughs> <laughs> That one's for our European listeners. That's, that's for our foreign viewers who actually have to deal with things like borders. Yeah, no, we I could drive eight hours directly south and still be in the same state. You drive well, eight hours in most directions and not cross a, not cross a political boundary. <laughs> or not well, even. Let's say, isn't in Europe a state a country, but in America, like America, the United States, a state is just like basically yeah. a provenance. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, most the of the time they'd be called uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, Illinois would not be a state. It would be a territory or a uh, province or a prefect. <laughs> it would not be uh, it would not be a state because state is a is, you know, the part of nation state. <laughs> but we are yeah. a nation. We are yeah. a nation comprised of many states. <laughs> <laughs> But kind of circling back to the agriculture, they followed the, the triumvirate that was very common in, in the quote-unquote New World in North and South America where they grew uh, maize, corn, and beans, which is kind of interesting because they plant all three crops in the exact same hole that they dig in the ground, and the corn stalk grows really quickly, so the beans are actually able to grow along with that, and they all give nutrients to each other, so it's actually like... Uh, it's really good for the soil along with the plants growing and being able to support a lot of people and the amount of calories that they're able to grow per acre skyrockets with that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is key um, to a lot of that. Um, they were also a uh, people with a lot of animal husbandry going on. Uh, these people had domesticated uh, not only llamas, uh, but also Guinea pigs for food. And even had domestic ducks. <laughs> you, they, you know, these ducks were kept about the same way that you would keep a chicken today, and were looked at about the same. But it's a domestic duck. <laughs> to be fair, you can eat duck eggs, and they're quite a bit larger than chicken eggs. So they're just they're smarter. They are smarter. Work smarter, not harder. Also, you can eat the duck, which is great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can but... eat the chicken too, but I think ducks are much cooler than chickens i'm just gonna put that out there so uh, Mo mochi aflac looks very different yes but i think all ducks are cool no, i'm a huge have... bird person but i hate chickens would so have... i think it's clear that they have ducks duck tartare then would they have like experimented in highbrow foods i don't know, I don't know but maybe. by some but if by some miracle you get a turkey down from North America, I'm certain they'd make a turducken. <laughs> <laughs> Has to be the most American meal. Now, what if we put a turkey and a duck and a chicken all together? It's called a crime against nature for a reason, Justin. 
And it's Colin, not what these people did. <laughs> Colin, do you know why they raised guinea pigs? Because that's the only one that I'm a little bit um, confused about and what purpose it would have being a domesticated animal. So they raised them for the same reason that the Incas would raise the Chihuahua. It was a portable meat source. Yes. Uh, you could put them in your bag, tie up the bag, carry it along with you, you'd ride for a day. That was your food for the night. You'd wake up, ride for the second day or run for the second day in this case. And you'd get mostly where you're going, and that was your food for the overnight journey. Yeah. Are they're... you saying that's why the Incas had chihuahuas? On yes, there? that's why the that's why chihuahuas are so small because it fit in your bag. You got your message with you. You got whatever you were carrying on your back. You run through the mountain for a day, eat that's the, so eat the dang hamster and chihuahua or whatever you got. What you've then never you been backpacking? Run for the next day. You're starving and tired by the second day, but you've typically made it where you're going and you someone there will feed you. <laughs> it, it's basically That's a so lunchable. Weird. It's basically a lunchable. <laughs> da, ba, ba, ba. Hamster Donalds. <laughs> well, I, fakes. That has just ruined my day. Oh my god. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> I thought you did. I'm sorry. This is such I an old fact. Oh my for god! No, I promise to I make won't it short it about why Chihuahuas are so small. <laughs> okay, I love Chihuahuas. It's so not fair. Those poor things. Okay. It's like, well, oh, buddy, where are we going? We're gonna go see a wonderful new place, Hammy. You're gonna be. It's gonna be a whole new town. Oh, see, they're gonna love you there. I'm gonna, really? Hey, I, I had a question. I noticed that while I was in your bag that you didn't have enough food for both of us. In, in fact, I didn't really see also, any I other found food. Really tiny skewer. Uh, but I just I see the stick and I see the blade. Like you guys are we're horrible. Cool, right? We're cool. Let's move on. Oh, Hammy, oh don't worry about a thing, Hammy. I'll take care of you. Stop As the fire's it. getting going, the skewers. <laughs> oh my god, stop it. Well, <laughs> but so besides today, that, they all... Gwen learned. They, they did also grow avocados, guavas, chili peppers. So they knew how to season their food, and they knew how to make a really good meal. I, what are you laughing about? This is accurate. This is historic. I'm not accurate. laughing. I just feel like you're saying this that they're like they season the guinea pig really well. And now, I, yeah. and, and now on uh, on 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 like was it what, what's a cooking show? What, like uh, on on cooking with Mochi Ramsey. Mochi show. Uh, we have you know we have you know avocado and guinea pig. Oh, instead of avocado toast, it's avocado guinea. Thank you guys so much. Oh, okay. Well, we found the new thing we're going to spend the rest of the episode on, guys. We hope you like it. But they also we're not going to get to the walkers or anything else. This is where we end. I, to, to get to get this train continue rolling because otherwise we're going to literally just keep talking about guinea yeah. pigs. Otherwise we're going to have to stay here overnight and eat our guinea pig. They, 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 uh, traded. Like, they had llamas too, okay? What do you they think they're probably... riding? <laughs> <laughs> the Mask of Zorro is really different in this version. I, in my head, everyone rides on horses, and I know that that's not culturally or geographically, you know, accurate. And then my next thought was donkeys. Oh, God. Okay, no, whatever. You're riding Cusco to town, and then you stop to have your snack. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> right. I absolutely love Cusco's new group. All right. All right. So get back to the people who are definitely not Incans. Yes. Uh, yes. Not okay. Incans, not talking about that. What did they trade in? What was their money like? So they Tell traded Lapis yeah, Lazuli, which if any gamers out here know from Minecraft, you know, that's the only other place Lapis Lazuli exists. And That's uh, a thing in Minecraft? Yeah, actually. it's uh, You can find blue. It's how you get, like, Lapis Lazuli blocks, which are bright blue. It's uh, painful to look at. And I just know shows. them from collecting rocks. So I was like, ooh, didn't know that was a game thing. And they would trade uh, the shells for distant products. So yeah, yeah, they had uh, spondylus shells, which uh, apparently had different values based on the color of the shell. It's almost like our current currency, which some have different colors, especially 
everywhere else except for the United States that uses one single color. Hey, 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 the five's got a purple mark on it now. And the hunter has oh, a blue mark. Nice. Or has the blue strip. Yeah. The new ones. The five's got the, remember they did that thing with the big purple five? <laughs> You know, otherwise in Canada, they have different colors. Europe, they have different colors. Australia. Okay, so Europe, Europe, I'm going to complain about this. All right. Europe, you all need to stop making the bills different sizes. All right. They don't fit in the damn wallet right. <laughs> you just have the wrong wallet. Okay. Can we just talk about the fact that their money is plastic? That's you guys are good. arguing sizes and wallets, but it's plastic. I thought they were still paper. Mm, they feel plastic. I know the Canadian money has Justin. A, they're laminated. But then also, uh, Canadian money has distinct maple, uh, s- like scent to it. Mm-hmm. Canadian dollar That's bills so are legitimately yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they're the only ones that make their money scratch and sniff. <laughs> All right. So moving on. You sure that's not just the paper? The, moving on from the money, uh. There was uh, there were some things that uh, culturally bound this group of people together. Uh, one of which was their religion, right? Right, Gwen. Yeah. What was? Let, let's hear. Let's hear some about what the religion was like. You say that as I put a chip in my mouth. God damn it, Colum. Is that right, or um, good? You choose. <laughs> Take the potato over the guinea pig <laughs> any day. They're adorable little creatures. Okay. And magically nutritious. Oh my god, y'all are gonna give me trauma through this. Okay, so um domesticating of... spiders, damn it. <laughs> you should stop. Uh no one needs to know my fears. Uh, that doesn't need to be public knowledge. Uh so within the religion um that all these places shared, um, there were three main gods for us to look at. Uh, so there is C, the moon goddess, and the supreme deity that kind of ruled over everyone. And she controlled seasons, storms, agriculture, and daily life. Um, when we get to the Wakas, she will be the god in the house of the moon uh, that's Temple worshipped. Of Temple of the moon, moon house. Waka, I'm sorry. It's, it's technically Waka of the moon. Or Waka, Waka Dele of Dele. the moon. My apologies. Uh, and then the next god on the rung is uh, Alpac, and he is the creator, uh, a sun god, or the son of the creator and the sun god. He's the creator um, and the sky god, or so, the son of the creator. And the sky oh my god, god. Uh, not, I'm so dyslexic, like, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he, he, he's in, he's in, uh, the reason this is confusing is because he is uh, featured in uh, Waka Waka the Soul, which is the sun, uh, which is the sun pyramid, but he's yes. not actually a sun god in any of the uh, research that we found. He's so, a creator sky and god. sky god, or the son of the creator and the sky god. Not I am a my own god. child. <laughs> is that where we get the term alpaca? No. No. Oh. No. No, it's not even, that, so not even close no. to the right spelling. Um, also, these people have llamas, right. damn you. <laughs> Etymology. But this this uh, god, this sky god, uh, was very important uh, because he was a creator of life. Um, so a lot of people worshipped him and they offered um, the blood of war prisoners and uh, citizens to them in um, ritual goblets and sacrifices. Uh, he was supposed to have lived in the mountains and, again, was offered human sacrifices. He was disp- disp- depicted my dyslexia is getting me today um depicted with a jaguar headdress fangs and snake earrings which that is a vibe i respect it so much (laughs) Uh, the next god we have is the decapitator god which was half man half jaguar and was represented um holding a sacrificial knife called a tumi um and a severed head that is metal yeah. as yeah. fuck. And, Very and my, metal. And my personal favorite uh, depiction of him, Gwen, can you tell us what that depiction <laughs> is? I will tell you what it is. 
and only for educational purposes will I not stab you for putting this in the notes, uh, is also shown as a gigantic blood-drinking spider. That is metal as he, fuck. I want a band name decapitator he's, guy. He's shown essentially um, as Shelob coming down from a ceiling and biting a person in the neck while they scream. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's, it's actually horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, even to me. <laughs> So we saw a lot of these mythic and religious figures um, in murals. Uh, they would be found in tombs that contained costumes and jewelries that were very iconic of these uh, figures. We also saw them in the ceramics and the metalwork pottery um, all across these people. So very important for them we will not go too heavily into the pottery as it is a lot if you guys want to know the differences and a lot of things let us know we'll make a uh hh reads about it or a mini episode video um yeah separate video video. um another final point on the religion uh just because it's uh something that i think is important to bring up because a lot of people make some assumptions about this um there was a a burial uh, a tomb for known as the tomb of the priestess uh, in La Senora de Cao. Uh, and there are murals in this tomb that show that the priesthoods were prominently female. Women yeah. dominated the priesthoods. And so religion was controlled by women uh, in this society, which um, given a lot of the major religions of the world today is not really something that happens too often. Yeah, I, I forget that people don't realize that um so i always forget to bring it up but yeah generally um you know a lot of religion especially older religion um you'll see a lot of women prominent with within that scope um and sometimes in a more patriarchal society it'll be the brother of a priestess or a specific person that will then put out that knowledge but it was generally women were thought to be kind of closer um to those naturalistic elements as like a whole like a a general thing i'm not specifically talking for here because we don't know too much about that but yeah yeah but like yeah like even even a very patriarchal society like the ancient greeks um in order to be an oracle you were a woman uh now, granted, they put the oracle above sulfuric fumes half the day, and she was spitting hallucinogenic nonsense most of the time, so it took yeah. male interpreters. But for the most part, to be the Pythia, the most prominent and powerful religious figure in all of Greece, you had to, you had to be a woman. Yeah. Uh, because so, women are supreme beings. Um. <laughs> it's... it's yeah, this culture is run by a queen of the gods, so yeah, <laughs> sure, <clears throat> we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, I'm just but, take my friend the decapitator god and some guinea pigs over to Gwen's house later. Oh, gods! No, no, no. I much prefer the half man, half jaguar. I will get down with that dude. The blood yeah. drinking spider. I'm gonna run away screaming. Um, I'll, I'll hang out with him. The decapitator yeah. and I, we can chill. Yeah. Like right. he can yeah. hit me. I do have a question that's not educational, but I do want to point up. All right, when you say when when you when you go for the half man, half jaguar, which halfway do you want to do this? Like mermaid half or minotaur half? <laughs> I I don't care trying to sleep with the dude i'm just saying we could vibe care. together you don't care <laughs> i don't care what you got down there oh my god again i'm just saying we could vibe together i'm not saying it's <sighs> surprise it's a guinea pig i <sighs> this this podcast is me now too. consist of going is now going to consist of me torturing gwen every week <laughs> It, you're you're welcome, so lucky America. you live far away from me. Um, yeah. Why? Is it because of the the spider god blood sucking or is it because the guinea pigs? Like, I'm going to need everything. some reasoning. It's everything I have ever done to this woman. And also, I'd like to just point out that if anything were to happen to Cullum, we have video and uh, audio evidence. So, well, I got your back. You know, I'm here. I, yeah. I, I'm supportive. That's the only way you're being supportive, though. I don't see you jumping in front of Column saying that you'll defend him physically. 
I you have my forget, own priorities. You, you all forget who does the research here, all right? This show's exactly. going to ground to a halt. You kill me. <laughs> Listen, I'm not saying I'd kill you. I mean, I am saying You're that. You're just saying but like, come close. Just severely. Mean. Yes. Yeah. Listen, right. I studied torture techniques as a uh -huh. young child. <laughs> All right, Dobby, never <laughs> kill, maybe maim, or seriously injure. Exactly. All right. All right. So Anyways. Moving um, along from that horrendous <laughs> aside. Um, that. Uh, so a lot of the uh, okay. mochis, they had a lot of, made a lot of pottery, especially the southern mochi. Um, the pottery is sculptural. Uh, which means that it is not um, is not just simply uh, images or paint on a functional jug, but rather it's made to look like an object. So it's made to look like a head. It's made to look like a jaguar. The cups are made to look like something physically, uh, which is very fun. Uh, the uh, the ceramics were made through molds. Uh, they typically uh, depicted. Uh, animals humans or anthropomorphic figures uh presumably deities of some kind uh basically imagine uh an angry jaguar standing on its hind legs <laughs> that'd be awesome yeah uh there is uh, um the coloration of these vessels was um uh they were slip painted which is uh, a form of doing this and very thin and they uh they were on a cream blade base with uh two different shades of red and a black color. There was red brown and red orange. So you've got some earthy tone. You've got a bit more of a skin or blood tone and then you've got darkness. <laughs> and that's yes. the color of these, of these vases. That is perfect. Yeah. Um, they, uh, um, early on, uh, there are more uh, animals, more plants, more supernatural figures being depicted then uh then later on later on they sort of get this uh u-shaped stirrup spout and it tends to become more of a head type vessel than uh rather uh more some of these more elaborate uh well, i shouldn't say i don't think it's elaborate from but then you know larger figures that they tend to focus on a different scale the body english is hard for me right now it's cool but it's interesting because the fine ceramics were used as gifts from the higher elites to the lower elites and the middle classes. And it was kind of a way to cement their social bonds and power structure of like, I am above you and I'm giving you this fine gift that you would not be able to afford yourself. Yeah. Peasant. It's, yeah. It's also, <laughs> it's also a good way uh, to show where your loyalties lie and who has your back in society. Because if you have this very fine looking ceramic vessel in your house, uh, everyone would know, oh, that's, you know, that's Chaco's. That's, you know, you, you, you're Chaco's man. Oh, we don't want to mess with him. You know, we should leave you alone. <laughs> yeah, you know, or maybe we should ask you for a favor since you've clearly got his ear in some way. Well, and they were also, they, they were held in high esteem, especially for the point that they're found both in households and graves. Like people are buried with this, which you're, we see a lot of that throughout history, especially in South America, of, like, grave goods being buried alongside the bodies. And the craziest part to me is they're all shown signs of use. It's not like they were decorative or they were symbolic. No, mm -hmm. they they absolutely put this to use. It's just treated with a great deal of respect so as not to break the dang thing. <laughs> yeah. And we also see that a lot of the ceramics are used in religious ceremonies um, and uh, along with copper bowls, tuning nice textiles, those things. So it, we see it in like kind of every part of the society. Yeah. And uh, in a bit of a shift to the Northern Mochi, the Northern Mochi, well, the Southern Mochi were uh, moving on uh, towards uh, developing this pottery, this clay work, a lot of that stuff. The Northern Mochi found that they could extract metal from a lot of the, uh, well, the rock around them and became metal workers. And they made a lot of ornamentation uh, for their people. They have massive ear spool spools, big nose piercing jewelry, um, head, uh, <laughs> excuse me, headdresses, bracelets there are these 
huge just panel necklaces that just cover your chest that they would make. Um, and they did it all through a, uh, a, a technique known as depletion gilding, which is where you take, uh, where's, where you take copper, mix in a little bit of gold, smelt it together. And the alloy looks like gold, but it's mostly copper. And so it's a way of, it's a way of, uh, it's a way of using a much cheaper metal to create more things that look high quality. That's honestly really fitting. smart. Yeah. It, it always looks like solid gold, but it's mostly copper. Um, they also like to inlay a lot of, uh, a lot of stones, a lot of like the lapis lazuli and other semi-precious rock that they had, they would put into these uh, various uh, objects. Yeah, turquoise was another stone that they really liked, right? Oh yeah, they liked yeah they liked blue. <laughs> they liked blue for for a lot of things. And they also one of the things that they really really liked was expanding by colonizing uninhabited areas. Uh, they'd force cultural adoption by the local powers, and of course, everyone's favorite warfare. If you oh can't, yes, if you can't join them, you beat them. Yep. Warfare <laughs> with a stick. <laughs> yep. Or a club in this case. Yeah. Warfare was very prominent to their society. Uh, most any time you see a depiction of people on mochi murals and art and reliefs, someone is dying. Either it's warriors in battle or human sacrifices uh, in some form. Uh, there was even a uh, they even had a sort of uh, seemed to have a sort of ritual. Um, a ritualization that's the word ritualization of combat uh there was a lot of uh emphasis in a lot of their art with this almost ritual form of combat which was shields and clubs and like this close hand-to-hand -hand, you know manly single duel outside the walls of troy whereas most of the actual warfare involves slings and atlatls which atlatls for those who don't know are these mechanisms that you put a spear into and you use it as kind of a fulcrum point to fling yeah. the, the spear. So you're able to actually fling it like 50 to a hundred meters. And um, because of a lot of recreations and a lot of testing of those people found out that you could be highly accurate up to like 150 meters. Like they're yeah. highly precise yeah. long distance weapons. I have used atlatls before. Um, and I can tell you, I, I got, I think once I missed my shot with yeah. the Addle Addle, like yeah. it was, it was fantastic to use. I, I think for people's like ideas, if you've never seen one before, you don't necessarily get how it works just from that description. If anyone's ever used a tennis thrower for like dogs, it's kind of like that. It gives you that extra power so you can throw it a lot farther. Yeah. Oh, this one's just yeah. made of wood. I do have a little bit of demonstration. So you've got oh, your spear, this lovely pencil, and you've got your atlatl, which is this other stick. And the <laughs> and your spear will hook onto the stick and you will take the spear back and you'll fling it and your off the atlatl and your spear will fly further, faster, and more and even more accurately. Uh mm -hmm. it once you, you know, actually practice with it a little bit. Yeah. And it's uh it's you know essentially it's essentially this motion of just you're holding it down here and you go yeah and you can fling it far far and it's also why a lot of times um archaeologists won't say arrowhead they'll most likely say projectile point yeah. because these were spears so the tips were quite a bit larger they weren't the small tiny little tips so it would do quite a bit of damage and you they would hit their target mm -hmm. upwards of 25 30 miles per hour which will instantly lodge into you. Yep. Yeah, these are a mount, mountain and valley people, so ranged warfare is the name of the game for them. If someone has gotten close enough to punch you, uh you have made a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you have not been quiet. You have not been aware of your surroundings. You've uh, probably fallen down the side of a mountain at least once. And missed all of your other shots. <laughs> but the exactly. thing about that is their art shows competence um, 
knocking helmets off one another, surrendering, and then eventually being sacrificed. Yeah. So even though most of the combat was long range, there still is this close, um, intimate battle that is memorialized. Yeah, it's almost, uh, it's almost, there seems to almost be a uh, part of a, like the ritual of sacrifice seemed to most likely have involved this form of combat where two people with clubs beat each other until one falls and that guy gets sacrificed. Well, it's like the three sets of sacrificed prisoners at Huase, Huase de la Luna in the Moche River Valley, which mm -hmm. took place at different times across hundreds of years. And the skeletons uh, show signs of combat and slit throats. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we have to remember that they didn't just sacrifice like war prisoners. They sacrificed their own citizens. So like you have to have some way to pick them out. And, uh, you know, at least it's not random. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, uh, and, uh, with, uh, with that, um, I think, uh, I think we've come to a point where uh, I'd like to just make a little public service announcement. Uh, most mochi art out there on the market in most places that is stolen art that is looted uh materials um so if you see something out there that's purporting to be original mochi art nine times out of ten that is stolen that is illegal that is looted um most of their art is uh is looted um this is uh not really helped in tracking them down by the mochi's own practice of reusing their own burial sites yeah. and essentially putting in more grave goods and burying a new person on top of the previous deceased which muddles with context a little bit and also does make it on occasion harder to tell if a site has been looted especially if time or uh, a, a desire to disguise what they've what what has happened uh, has resulted in it being in the hole being filled back in. It it also I think should be noted that most antiquities markets that show any authentic artifacts tend to be in that same area of looted. The difference is the stuff that claims to be legitimate and ha to have proper provenience tends to have been looted before antiquity laws were put into place. So a lot of the stuff that you see on the market that may claim to be mochi may have been legally acquired back in the day because there was no law outlawing it, the practice. But we still see that a lot today, and there are severe, severe penalties for looting. Yep. We, we thoroughly discourage looting, both for historical context and for the context of the dead who are buried. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um and uh yeah and there is there was one burial that was actually managed to be found that was not looted uh at sapan uh the very uh, famous lord of sapan uh they uh they made a uh they built an entire museum around it in the town uh just to host uh this man's massive array of grave goods uh he was buried with everything uh under the sun that the mochi have seemed to have ever made <laughs> uh yeah so he must have had some sort of uh some sort of political uh clout yeah he was uh he was an he was an important man uh and he uh you know so he was uh he was a very big find for uh it was a very big find for everyone i'm trying to see where i put in the notes uh he was let's see here his corpse was prepared and placed in a cane coffin, yeah. which sounds like it would look so cool. Uh, his head faced the south, and all of his limbs were extended. Mm -hmm. uh, ow. Sorry, I just hurt myself. Um, it was a highly stylized with uh, many grave goods, uh, copper at the hands, mouth, um, and under feet. Hold on, I can't read that. Oh yeah, copper was at the hands, the mouth, and under the feet of the de deceased. Yep. Yep. Uh, there was also uh, one of my personal favorites again uh, uh, for Gwen. Uh, he one of his most prominent pieces of jewelry was a necklace made of gold spiders. 
Oh, he honored the decapitator. This man was metal as hell. Okay, I do like that it's around his neck because it does honor the decapitator. Mm -hmm. So right at the neck where you'd get decapitated, it's a necklace. That's cool. Uh, It's creepy, and I hate that you told me that um, as Uh, I can picture that. Even creepier was there was a lot of items rela- related to the sea. He was buried with a lot of spondylus shells, which is uh, the mochi cash. And uh, he had uh, what has been described as an octopus breastplate. Oh. Okay, that wow. sounds amazing. This yeah. guy just sounds like my hero. <laughs> it is a, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, these are the Lords of Sapan. Uh, there is the Lord of Sapan and there is the Old Lord, both of whom were found. Uh, and are a part of the uh, museum of the, you know, the Lord of Sapan, uh, the museum they built for it. I don't have the name in front of me because I get lost even in my own uh, field of reeds over here. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. But uh, um, one of the reasons uh, why there's all this uh, sea stuff is the Mochi believe that they came out of the sea um, as part of their origin story. Uh, myth is there's there's indications the mochi believe that they came from the sea and that the sea was the provider and the destroyer which when you're living in a rocky desert on the coast kind of makes sense (laughs) yeah yeah it does that is super interesting that is something that is very common too and very interesting is you could tell what the importance of indigenous cultures are based off of their origin stories. And that tends to be very true across the board of like different origin stories, different beginnings tend to have different emphasis, emphasis. And you see that translated into cultural imagery, cultural practices. And yeah, you, you kind of bring out an obvious point when there's, you know, massive mountains to your east and water to your west you're going to tend to rely heavily on the water. Yep. Well, yeah, just being coastal in general. Uh, that's one of the really interesting things with uh, Mythos is how um, incredibly influenced it is through the environment and changes in the environment. That's why you see like a lot of um, apocalypse myths. Uh, you'll see like great floods because that was something that could destroy people or with you know, the Norse, you have a fiery end and you can see it through the geography and the different weather patterns that, you know, we can predict from back then. And every culture, every society, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, had some sort of natural deity, some sort of deity over aspects of of nature, water, sky, earth, storm. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's only recently, um, uh, that we haven't had, um, you know, a, a natural deity I, is. I need, I need to tie gods to elements. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. Speaking of uh, all these, uh, all these things. Um, if you want to see the uh, the Lord of the Lords of Sea Pond, uh, you can actually see them today. Uh, you can see a lot of their stuff uh, uh, in the Museum of the Royal Tombs of Sapan. However, um, I do, I do also recommend, though I have not gone to these museums personally because they are in uh, Peru and I have not gone to Peru. Um, I do give a lot of props to the Museo di Sitio Waka Rajada or Rajada, uh, because in the in the years since uh, the turn of the millennia, um, fourteen more burials were found at Sipan intact, and uh, the. Uh, Museo di Sitio Waka Rajada um, has a unique, a slightly unique practice of only restoring the ob- half of the, any object they display. So you can see the objects as they would have been in the uh, in ancient times and as they look when they come out of the ground and it's the same object. So you can That's see what we cool. would see as archaeologists and what was put in the ground. That is so cool. The only thing that I have a question about that, and it just, it's my area, is I wonder what the descending community say just about the burials being excavated and their thoughts on that. But if they're cool with it... It's been about a millennia since uh, the Mochi existed. Um, Yeah, but there's still descendants. We talked about that. Yeah, there is a lot of descending communities. 
I'm just saying I don't have a lot of information on that, but my understanding is that the people of Sipan, uh, the people living in that t- in that town, uh, basically demanded the museum for the Lord, and like it was their big thing, and it was their point okay. of national pride. Like it was almost it was like we're on the map. This is our national pride. We are the greatest uh, pre Inca settlement in existence. Uh, all hail us. Better than Rome. I just I I wanted to clarify that and also to say like they don't exist pulls a lot of ethical uh, issues that I'm I'm not saying they don't I'm not saying they don't exist I'm just saying it's been a thousand years since the mochi people have been a political entity as far as we know but I think talking about the god territory really liked really wanted the museum but I think talking about the gods goes a really good segue into the wakas the temples And the wakas are these large monumental pyramids that we started off talking about. They were part temple, part palace, administrative center. Mm -hmm. They were a ritual meeting place. They were large platform mounds made of adobe bricks. And they were usually topped with patios, rooms, corridors, high bench seats for rulers. And um, most moche centers had two wakas, one large and one small. And the cities would be usually nestled between the two. And uh, I just have to say the Mochi must have had great internet connection using all that Adobe. Yeah, well, you know, that's how they got started. They started there and then they expanded their business from actual bricks to just internet development softwares. Yep. But it, it, we see a good deal of city planning and organization as the streets were all um, organized. Ordinary people lived in rectangular Adobe brick compounds containing mm-hmm. multiple fam- families and these compounds had rooms for living, sleeping, craft workshops, storage facilities. Like, you could do most of your life within the con- confines of your own home. Yep. Yep. We love it. Yep. And there are uh, two very major uh, uh, major wakas constructed around 450 uh, CE. The, which is about the uh, point at which uh, the mochi have already split, but it's also the point at which they are the most, pro- they're at some of their more prominent stages. This is, uh, for lack of a better term, among the height of their culture as a uh, geopolitical force. Um, they are the Huaca del Sol and the Huaca de la Luna. Uh, del Sol is the larger of the two pyramids. Uh, it is four tiers and 40 meters high today however many uh many wakas have been uh corroded uh by time specifically rain and other weather and so while it is 40 meters today it would have originally exceeded 50 meters in height uh so this is a this is a massive tower that should be even bigger if we were being honest with ourselves (laughs) <laughs> and, and also metric is clearly the superior measuring system yep yeah, yeah. and uh, i don't think anyone would disagree with us other than americans so. yeah. and uh one of the things to uh that really speaks to this culture uh being very well organized and being very well off is all all 140 million adobe bricks that were put into building this structure were stamped with a manufacturer's mark. That is incredible. So they had an existing company or uh, or workshop that was commissioned to produce these bricks, and they stamped them all as coming out of this this particular uh, this particular industrial zone. So it's not just, hey, John, build you know, make me bricks. No, it was it's- Bob's uh, Bob's Adobe Brick Factory. <laughs> I'm not gonna let builder. me live that down. So, someone starts singing Bob the Builder in Spanish. <laughs> I do not know it in Spanish, but I do know the entire thing in English, and it's kind of sad that I still remember it. And at the Adobe Brick Factory cafeteria, can you guess what's on the menu? God, I hate you people. All right. <laughs> All right. Huaca de la Luna. All right. Yep. It was 500 meters away and was composed of 50 million bricks, uh, had three tiers. And um, ooh, I do not know how to pronounce that. Pronounce that for me, Colin. It was three tiers, and it had friezes, uh, which is a form of it's a form of uh, mural where you essentially 
chisel into a wall an image of something typically in profile. Uh, you, it can be used to tell a story kind of like a running ticker tape or uh, if you ever drew like a thousand, uh, did one of those little books where you draw like, you know, the same thing over and over again to make it move slightly. Yep. It's essentially like that where you can tell a story by just running images along a wall. Uh, so it's got friezes uh, depicting a lot of their mythologies and rituals. Um, I was going to say Frieza, like the character from Dragon Ball Z, and I was like, that doesn't sound right. No, Frieza, no, no way. Yeah. Um, and uh, like a lot of classical architecture and art, these were originally very brightly colored. Um, they were painted red, white, yellow, and black in just very vibrant colors. The whole dang you know, multi-million brick uh, structure. <laughs> That's my favorite vibrant color is black. The, the scale is just absurd, though. When you're talking millions yeah. and millions of bricks, like, it's not as, as daunting of a task as, like, the Great Pyramid of Giza with the massive 40,000 ton bricks, but still, you're talking 140 million. Imagine the accountant having to like you calculate all of them yeah it's a pain it, it, it's a real pain uh the, imagine uh, the architects yep uh, yeah. the architects don't care the engineers had to figure out how the math works and yeah. then the poor construction guys gotta place the order some bobs... I mean, most architects also do engineering but yeah, yeah. uh so uh, a little fun fact with uh, all this architecture here these pyramids, uh, the, the, the wakas, doubled as mausoleums. Um, because, you know, if you're going to kill somebody at, a, at the top of one of these things, you really don't want to drag the body down. You know <laughs> what? That is true. If I'm being Work honest. smarter, uh, not harder. Yeah. De La Luna, uh, specifically, uh, and both these, uh, both these wakas are at, the, uh, are at the city of Mochi in the Mochi territory. Uh, Waka De La Luna uh, has over... 40, uh, over 40 people under the age of 30 uh, buried at its base uh, with clear evidence of uh, human sacrifice being involved in their death. Forbes, 40 under 30. <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite is the expressive, like, expressly written, like, evidence of mutilation and being thrown from the summit. Just like... Yep. I mean, it's explicit. effective, though. It is yep. effective. It, if... If there was any questions that they would have survived the mutilation, they definitely weren't after being thrown fifty meters. Well, I don't. I don't necessarily think uh, they would have been alive after the mutilation, as the mutilation appears to consist of pulling your limbs out of your sockets and ripping your jaw from your skull. No, you can survive that. You will not be having fun, but the blood loss is what will kill you. Yeah, you yeah you, you've got it. I'm just saying. By the time we've got the second one of these things off. You're in shock and you're bleeding out. You're not alive anymore. There's no medical treatment. Depends to on how you. quickly they chop it off. You gotta know if they're fishing or not. Yeah, uh, if they were really gruesome. This is ritualized. We were, they were well organized and it was ritualized. So in theory, they could have like a huh? machine system of doing it. Like okay, huh? left arm, left leg, right arm, right leg. All right, jaw. All right, and just eat them off the cliff. Yeah. At the same Listen, time, as long as they didn't start with the legs first and sever that femoral artery, it could be a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know if these guys were going like the Aztecs were and going for efficiency of like, let me show you your heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> like these guys, I don't know. I don't necessarily know if they were going for efficiency, but they could have. Um, one of the uh, fun theories about all this is that um, Waka de la Luna lies atop a lot of really soft ground. Its foundations are very soft. And so the heavy El Nino rains would have been, caused a lot of problems for this city in particular. And uh, so it's believed that a lot of the sacrifices were, would have been tied to controlling that waterfall since, you know, you don't want to sink into the ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get and that one. You, and, and you know, she does control the weather. So that yeah, makes sense. If, if you're convinced that, you know, an angry moon lady is in charge of the rain. You might, uh, you might throw things at her to make her stop. <laughs> well, okay. Things you could throw but can at I her. just? Oh no. Okay, go ahead, Justin. 
Oh, well, Gwen, I think you'll get a kick out of this. Where ceremonia goblets that were found with human blood. Oh, yeah. They fill, oh, they, they they fill cups different. with your blood. Please <laughs> stop. <laughs> so what I think is really cool is that they associated this moon goddess with the water and rain. Um, and we do know that the moon affects the ocean. So the moon is very heavily tied with water. And I just find that interesting. That, like, what was the back then. What was the tide upon? What? Tides are controlled by the by the moon. Yeah. And they're on the coastline, so you'd have tides. Yeah. You you made a pun unintentionally. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just went over my head. I'm like, I don't know. Are you gonna finish your sentence? It's like it's like it's like, yes, Justin. Tides do happen at the coast. (laughs) <laughs> but, Bob, you know basically you made the pun theory. it didn't even recognize it i just had to point it out you didn't need to point it out it would have been funnier if we just went along like it never happened you can't Way just pretend like puns don't exist yeah i'm not pretending they don't exist i'm just moving on from them yeah all right so we had cer- ceremonial goblets with human blood found in them brilliant yeah. love it yeah and there is a lot of dense occupation in and around these temples, just indicating that this was a thriving community that continued on for a long time doing uh, all this wonderful stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the wonderful stuff, the mutilation, the, the goblets of blood. Warfare, human sacrifice, pottery, metalwork. I, I'm assuming what everyone the, uh, wants in their city, you know? I, I'm assuming the, the elites metropolis. live near the... The elites live near the pyramids, right? Or was that where the low-income people lived? Like, how likely was it that a mutilated corpse was about to come flying down in your backyard? Uh, I don't have the distribution of wealth across the uh, city, uh, the cities of the Mochi. Um, I don't know how close or far you would be from a ritual center. I would assume the wealthier people are nearer to ritual, either ritual centers or the urban center in the in between the two. Um. It, I, I'm not entirely certain. Um, I do know that one of their elite castes was associated with agriculture, so it might make sense for at least that group to be based further away from, from say, you know, large buildings that don't produce grain. <laughs> yeah. But I don't act. We I don't actually have that information on the distribution of that. Um, a lot of the excavations are uh, pre two thousands. Uh, so there tends to be a lot more of a focus on uh, monumental architecture and elite lifestyle and burial. Uh, however, excavations have continued, uh, especially at Sapan, after uh, the 2000s. Uh, and that has led to 14 more uh, elite burials that have been found. However, I don't know if there's been a lot of urban archaeology undertaken beyond the uh, markings of you know, how the cities were laid out. So, Justin, if you want to do your PhD on that, I'd have to talk to some some people uh, about uh, whether or not a socioeconomic study of the mochi has been conducted (laughs) uh, for for the history of the uh, ancient mochi. Uh, One of the saddest things, actually, about all these wakas and uh, the burials is um, when the Spanish came, they diverted uh, the Rio mochi to collapse the Waka del Sol and loot its tombs. Holy because shit. the Waka del Sol also had tombs. And it's not just rain that has caused it to lose an entire uh, fifth of its height. It has, uh, it was purposely targeted for Whoa. destruction. Man, fuck the Spanish. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, God, I love the Spanish. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, man, we're in North America, so we usually hate the English, but spain <laughs> why uh, i mean to be fair spain brought you know conquistadors death destruction they they didn't treat they didn't treat anyone with respect so they, you they know. desired I mean, one thing gold <laughs> europe in general or i will say the, the more um western part of europe uh the best of people Spain, France, Keep England. talking, you Eastern European. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, keep talking. 
Listen, I'm a mix of a lot of things. I can talk shit about everyone. I love how both Western European and none of the people's responsible unless you count the first one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And even then, I'm too far south for him. (laughs) All righty. So do you want to talk about some of the archaeologists that worked on these excavations? Yeah, we can. Uh, I don't know how far we've drawn this out. If we're at a good time to stop, we've done a lot. We've gone through. Uh, um, we, we've gone through a lot of things for this culture. We could do a brief little run through. We could do like a quick ten minute thing, and then yeah, we can wrap up. All right, sure. So yeah. I can run down. Not some belaboring the point too much. Yeah, sure. I can run down some of these people. So I guess the first person to run through um, would be. Uh, um, Max Ule, uh, U-H-L-E. He was the first archaeist, uh, first archaeologist to study the mochi. Uh, he began in the early 20th century, so about 100 years ago. Um, the ceramics he recovered uh, were placed into the first relative chronology, giving us uh, the beginnings of that timeline we, we went over at the start of this episode. Uh, those, uh, those were originally uh, conducted by Raphael Larco Hoye, uh, who is considered the father of Mokshi archaeology for his ability to essentially give us a timeline of their existence, uh, which does vary quite a bit because they were so spread out uh, and divided as a people. Then uh, we have a couple other important archaeologists, including, I believe... Um, let's see, I want to do this in the right order. Uh, so at, um, with the Lord of Sipan and Rock, uh, Huaca Rahada was, uh, discovered by Walter Alava and Luis Chiro. Um, they, uh, they made, uh, that discovery that essentially major, um, find of just not only the pyramid, but also the Lord of Sapan that has led to those museums and brought a lot of life and culture back into uh, the region. Uh, Fun fact that Waka that they discovered is known as the split Waka uh, because uh, someone plowed a road through it. (laughs) So it's been split in two. Um, Yeah. You gather that you can understand that during the intervening uh, millennia, less and less respect was paid to these uh, sites, especially uh, during the last uh, 300 years. Almost seems like more work to to plow through Wawaka than to just go around. You would think that. However, keep in mind, we're in mountains, and there is one valley, and there's a giant building in the way that it belongs to a heathen god, and you're Spanish. <laughs> yeah, not to mention the Spanish purposefully targeted religious sites and things that would have been considered religious importance. I mean, considering the fact that there were plenty of Mayan uh, monuments that the Spanish quite literally just built Catholic um, churches on top of. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that that's fair. Yep. I mean, not to do, but like... To, a point to make. Yeah, yeah, a fair point to make. The Spanish definitely took their religion very seriously and definitely used that as a point to attack others with. Yep. Um, People using their religions to attack others? Gwen, 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 we... When, so <laughs> when the Lord of Sapan, when the Lord of Sapan was, uh, was excavated, uh, one of the names that comes up is a physical anthropologist named John Verano, who... Uh, established uh, the man's status as um, as a high-ranking noble through a lot of tooth wear and basically rebuilt the skeleton uh, from the ground up and did a lot of the analysis that helps us understand what his diet and life was like for him and for Mochi people, as uh, it is largely inferred that the diet of an elite person in a society is reflective of that society, just at a more nutritious level. Yeah, um, it is how it is done. Um, it was uh, one of the interesting things uh, about about that was um, from from Verano's uh, work is that it was believed that the Lord of Sapan may have perished in either an epidemic or a famine. Uh, 
Jesus. So uh, it is. It is. It is consi- that that was one of his considerations. Uh, despite knowing that the man had access to good food, with you know the lack of toothware, still this still got him. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because the archaeologists can do a number of tests to determine quite a few things. Like you can test for uh, carbon and nitrogen content in the bones, and it could tell you um, effectively. Uh, what the diet was of the person, whether it consisted primarily of meats, vegetables, certain plants, um, with maize being with maize being a staple of their um, diet, you would see significantly higher amounts of nitrogen. Um, and then also the toothware is important, especially with corn, because with the introduction of maize, one of the main ways to consume it is by grinding it with a mano and matate, which is effectively a pestle and mortar or just a grinding mechanism. Yeah. And a lot of times when you're doing that, you get micro pieces of stone. And when you eat the food, you don't feel it, but it can actually expedite tooth wear and can wear down your teeth quite a lot faster. So it's very important to note that he's probably eating a higher quality food, a higher threshold of food. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one last archaeologist I'd like to give a shout to here, um, even though she is not in the notes, is, uh, is, uh, Helene Silverman, uh, an Indian archaeologist of uh, my undergraduate alma mater of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, who has done, uh, who has also done uh, a number of, uh, all right, a number of different works and insights into the Mochi and other uh, Andean cultures around them, uh, such as the Nazca, <laughs> who were uh, contemporary to the Mochi. Uh, uh, for those of you wondering, the Nazca are the people who Nazca are the people who made those lines uh, that can be seen from above. That everyone also attributes to aliens. Uh, so, <laughs> gonna give a quick shout out to uh, uh, Helene Silverman. Uh, yeah. yeah, I uh, I finally did it. <laughs> finally did this video. <laughs> okay. Promising so. her it for years. <laughs> So I think that's probably a good point for us to wrap up. So if you guys like listening to this content or if you like what we're doing, be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, um, whatever way you listen to the podcast. And be sure to follow us on YouTube. Our next big goal is to try and hit 100 subscribers. So if we could get everyone over there to subscribe, we'd really appreciate that. Especially because now we are starting to upload hh reads on every friday which uh column here is yeah. our lovely guide and reader and i post shorts and tiktoks on both youtube and tiktok so be sure to follow us across all of our platforms obviously the links are going to be in the show notes yeah. and uh thank you guys for checking us out 10 episodes seems like a huge accomplishment so far we've been doing this for 20 weeks <laughs> and it's uh it's been quite the journey yeah and uh we are gonna celebrate that with our next video topic column yes uh so coming up on uh on historical humans uh the next uh podcast will be on uh friday the 13th uh that podcast will air on the um second of of may (laughs) no way this will jinx us whatsoever so it's going to be on friday the 13th that cultural phenomenon uh that has gone through the world uh in the uh intervening weeks uh on fridays you can look forward to uh an hh reads of first the saga of the vol songs a nordic uh epic poem and uh the uh the satirical work candid by the french uh philosopher voltaire uh, those will be coming up. Additionally, um, because this is such a large topic that we have covered, that literally an entire culture of people, if there is anything you want to see us do more of or focus on more of in a separate side video, do let us know in the comments down below to, uh, and we'll see, you know, to, you know, just tell us and we'll see if we can do it. Uh, anything from the different wakas, the Lord of Sapan, the, uh, architecture the ceramics uh just the timeline and history of these people anything that you uh that you uh found interesting that you didn't think got fully covered or at least not as covered as you would like it to even beyond we can that, go the, much further into them 
Yeah, even beyond that, if there's any topics that you'd like to see us discuss or talk yeah. about, be sure to drop it in the comments. Let us know. We want to do things that you guys want to watch. Yeah. We're right now we're talking about topics that we're all interested in and that we want to talk about, but let us know if there's something that we don't know about because while we may be considered quote unquote experts of archaeology, I do that in air quotes because nobody's truly an expert. You just have knowledge bases. But we, we want to learn as well. We're he- This is an educational podcast, even though we joke and we uh, mm-hmm. make fun. But And, and tease our co-hosts. <laughs> Guinea pigs. Stop. <laughs> this is going to make me Spider. sad again. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anything what? else that you guys want to say before we wrap it up here? No, uh, just have a good uh, week. Uh, happy Easter to those people that celebrated it. Uh, Ramadan for our yes. brothers in Islam, and also Passover for our Jew, our, our Jewish followers. So, you know, enjoy your religious weekend. And for anyone who is not a follower of those faiths, enjoy your regular April weekend. Hopefully, you get some good weather. And we will catch you all in two weeks. Have a good day. Bye.